Hello listeners, I'm back in Taiwan now. I've been back for almost a week after having spent approximately three weeks in Japan. Japan is a pretty amazing place, although I also found it to be quite depressing in a number of very specific ways, at least for me. But let's deal with the positive first. The Japanese really do deserve their status as honorary Aryans. They have built a highly functional, high-trust society. The trains really do run exactly on time. The streets and other public spaces are clean, well-ordered and safe. Things are well-designed and user-friendly. There's a definite, highly advanced aesthetic consideration to everything that they do. People are extremely courteous and aware of others and willing to help others even when they don't have to when it's not a sort of a um, commercial transaction or that sort of thing. And other than the fact that I had the misfortune of experiencing two typhoons within about a, a week or a week and a half, something like that, in the time that I was there, and that it also rained for almost every day that I was in Japan, it was a breeze getting around and doing things there, even with a two-year-old child in tow. And in particular, I really have to note that a lot of Japanese people went out of the way to help me. And actually, not just me. I saw them helping each other and other foreigners. But a lot of people went out of their way to help me in places like train stations when, when I couldn't find an elevator and I had to go upstairs with all sorts of luggage and a kid and all of this sort of thing. I had men in business suits come up to me and just, just help me. Just they, they just volunteered for it. And people were like that generally everywhere I went. They were extremely helpful, and it was it was really heartwarming, shall we say, to encounter that, because uh, this brings me to my first depressing thought: what's wrong with Taiwan? Uh, my thoughts about the differences between Japan and other parts of Asia that I have visited, including Taiwan, where I've been living for about a decade, can best be summed up by the following thought. In Japan, I experienced almost no culture shock. Now, this may be the result of having lived in East Asia for a decade and understanding the broad cultural influences and as such where people are coming from to some degree. So things like Confucianism and Buddhism and so on. Um, and also being able to understand some of the language because I can read a fair number of Chinese characters, and they use Chinese characters in Japanese. Some of them are modified a little bit, but uh, I was able to start picking up Japanese words because I already knew the meaning, and they would announce the names of places, or they'd be written in English, and so I could just go, oh, okay, that's how they said in, in Japanese, because I already know the meaning. Uh, so I didn't really experience any kind of severe culture shock when I was there. And, and, and I wasn't sort of like, oh, wow, look at that, that's crazy. Oh, my God, what are they doing? Uh, I was, it, was, it was a very sort of low-key uh, surprise when I went around in different places. But Japan was like an upgraded version of Taiwan in every regard. Probably the main area in which I did experience culture shock was with regard to traffic. I probably came off as quite paranoid when I was there because I probably looked as though... I spent the entire time furiously shaking my head around looking for the next maniac and where he was going to come from and almost run me over. And when I talk about being run over, I'm not actually exaggerating here. Those of you who have been subscribed to my channel for a fair amount of time will remember that the day before Christmas last year, I did actually get run over in Taiwan, as in somebody rode over a scooter and on top of me and I felt the wheels on my back. And... Incidentally, that court case is still ongoing. It's just, it's a saga. Um, so I don't think I was entirely paranoid to to uh, wonder if people were going to run me over. And yet, of course, in a place like Japan, that doesn't happen because people are civilized. As if to confirm this, when I returned to Taiwan, as soon as I exited the airport, I found myself waiting at a pedestrian crossing. And then the light changed. And... I didn't immediately step onto the road, for I knew better having lived here for a while, because immediately, right on cue, a taxi ran a red light and ripped through the intersection across the pedestrian crossing, and I thought, yep, I'm back in Taiwan. Now, in the 
approximately approximately a week that I've been back, I have experienced dozens and dozens and dozens of crazy traffic incidents and people generally behaving like idiots. They don't give up their seats to pregnant women on public transport. They do the I'm asleep or I didn't see you, that kind of routine. Uh, you know, just all this sort of stuff for cripples, you know, anyone who's has a broken leg or that kind of thing. They don't do that here. They're really uncivilized. Everyone is always cutting a corner and I don't just mean with regard to the traffic. And just engaging in petty, anti-social, selfish behavior all of the time. And, and they all think, if I do this, I'll get an edge on that guy. But when you have a whole lot of people doing that, nobody gets an edge. In fact, everyone ends up worse off because of frictional costs. But you can't explain that to them. There's a general level of chaos and disorder that is reminiscent of the third world, places like Vietnam or Cambodia, where I've also visited rather than the first world, such as Japan. There's a degree of incompetence, and I could go into a whole story about the other day doing this thing with my dogs with the, uh, a government office, and they wouldn't admit that they'd screwed up, and then we finally got them to admit it, and they were just trying to get out of there because they wanted to go home from work, and then they had to redo it, and the whole thing took them longer than it would have if they just admitted that they'd done it incorrectly the first time and then fixed it. Uh, but there's a degree of incompetence that is at once studied and nonchalant in this place. So, <laughs> what's wrong with Japan? Um, oh, sorry, what's wrong with Taiwan? Not what's wrong with Japan. Um, and together with even pushier, ruder, less civilized Chinese tourists, about whom I will probably devote an entire video and speak at length, uh, it wears me down, and it makes me want to get the hell away from the Han Chinese and make sure that they don't get into my country, because Asians, they're not all the same. There's, there's at least one place where they're really civilized. They've got all of this figured out. Uh, and money won't solve this issue. This is not about development, because Taiwan is in the top 10 nations for millionaires per capita, and the Chinese tourists you see abroad are the rich ones. Yet despite all of this wealth to spend on buying, building, or wearing gaudy crap, they just can't figure out how to stop being rude idiots. And it's probably because it runs much deeper than that. Now, anyone who does not believe in HBD, that's human biodiversity, population differences, at even the most subtle level, need only consider the vast differences, and there really are vast differences, between... Japan and its close neighbors. In any future war between Japan and its neighbors, I'm siding with Japan, but more on that later. As an aside, I'd like to mention how both Japan and Taiwan, yes, Taiwan, actually get something right that my hometown of Melbourne in Australia gets terribly wrong. Well, actually, Melbourne gets many things terribly wrong, but that's a whole other issue. Here I'm referring to something as simple as traffic lights. The cultural wars erupted once more earlier this year when Melbourne decided to change some traffic lights such that the walking figure was thereafter clad in a dress. It's the only, to my knowledge, it's the only place in the world where they've been this fucking stupid. But it begs several questions. For instance, whether the figure was unisex to begin with and how to get past stereotyping people and equality and all of this sort of thing and then go on and represent all women with a dress. And people actually did complain about this also. You no know, stereotyping women as wearing a dress. I mean, it's a god, grave. Um, but all of this misses a much deeper point. I mean, well done, Melbourne, for fixing something that wasn't broken. Well done. I wonder if all of those politicians and bureaucrats who spend so much taxpayers' money traveling the world on so-called fact-finding missions have ever noticed that in Japan and Taiwan, there are countdown timers on the lights. And they have a different system in each place. In Taiwan, they have numbers. And in Japan, they have dots that disappear. But you can figure out each dot is five seconds or whatever. Uh, and, and it's so that you know how much time you have remaining before the light is going to change. Even then, as soon as the light changes, they don't all drive like maniacs and try to run you over. But this is why we can't have nice things in the West anymore. Heaven forbid that when you do spend a whole lot of money, public money, 
changing something as seemingly innocuous as traffic lights. You do so for functional reasons. You think, hey, we have problems with jaywalkers and the flow of traffic and so on. Let's put numbers on the traffic lights so that everyone knows where they stand. No, heaven forbid that you should do it for functional reasons rather than as an opportunity to bell to everyone around the head with cultural Marxist ideology. I mean, we couldn't have sensible public policy now, could we? Side rant over. The next depressing thought about Japan was that it is truly a mouse utopia. There's no struggle in Japan. It's a comfortable, safe, logical place in the main. For instance, Kyoto is beautiful, but it's like a sterile museum full of old people waiting to die. They have all these beautiful temples and shrines and so on in Kyoto, but everyone there is waiting to die. Elderly Japanese constantly fawned over my son, probably because they have no grandchildren of their own. And it's really sad when you see old people and, you know, they desperately want grandchildren. They don't have them and they'll never get them. And then they latch onto somebody else's grandchild or child. But likewise in Japan in general, but Tokyo in particular, people are unbelievably conscious of aesthetics. They have a real sense of it in, in a way that most Westerners don't. So uniforms are omnipresent. Everyone wears a uniform from people who work on um, public transport to restaurant workers to school children, construction workers, everyone. And they have all these particular uniforms and they wear them with extreme care and pride. If you see uh, taxi drivers in Australia, in as much as they, they probably don't wear uniforms, I can't remember, but, uh, in, in, well, in the instances where they do, uh, they look like complete slobs. The taxi drivers in Japan look like they're out of some sort of uh, movie where, there was sh where you would expect them to be chauffeuring the emperor or something like that. They're all very well dressed and they don't, they don't look like they've been wearing the same shirt for seven days. Um, even amongst the general populace, it was extremely rare to see anyone who was poorly dressed or didn't take real pride in his or her appearance. You had to see these people to believe them. They take it to a whole other level. The hair, the makeup, the shoes, the accessories, the whole bit. Uh, every single person there just about looked like he or she had just got off the set for a fashion magazine photo shoot. Even the ugly people were extremely well dressed. Uh, and this is a strong contrast to the pretty gaudy gear worn by Taiwanese and other Asians or the generally scruffy demeanour of many Westerners and the um, face tattoos and all of the rest of it in the West. You see tourists getting around in rented kimonos in Japan. It's a bit of a touristy thing. You see these chicks getting around in kimonos. I actually saw some, uh, I think they were probably Malaysian or Indonesian chicks with kimonos and um, headscarves. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, maybe that's the future of Japan. Um, but you, you see these tourists getting around in this gear and, and men as well. Um, but the Japanese actually wear this sort of thing in public, more so women than men. And... You can tell who the Japanese are because they're immaculate. Everything is arranged just so. The way they wear these things, the way they move everything. They look like they've just been plucked from a piece of artwork. It's really amazing. And, and they have that same sense of aesthetics in everything that they do. The way they design parks and everything. I mean, it's really phenomenal. The way they package little goods. You buy a little thing and it's all perfectly packaged. It's, it's really amazing. So one day I found myself in a part of Tokyo called Harajuku and there's a street there that was like a temple to commerce. There was a big wide street and it had the incredible buildings and it was full of incredibly beautiful people, well-dressed people in incredibly beautiful shops looking at and buying incredibly beautiful things, whether food or pieces of furniture or whatever, clothing, the whole lot. But I came away from there feeling incredibly depressed. Now, that could have just been because it was raining that day. But, but nevertheless, um, and and it's well, it's it's also not because it brought into sharp relief my own extremely poor taste in fashion. But it was because it was all pointless. Because here's the kicker: the Japanese don't have children. They have one of the lowest birth rates in the world. 
So, who are they beautifully dressed for? For themselves, perhaps? It's obviously not to attract mates. Not when approximately half of the young people in Japan have declared themselves voluntarily celibate. So you see these young women and these young guys in really sh a pair of really sharp leather shoes and all of the rest of it, and you look at them and you think, half of you have just completely lost the plot. And, and you have to think, what's going to become of them? What's going to, who's going to look after them when they're old? Uh, what's going to become of their country? How does such a place manage to survive under those circumstances? Now, there are a lot of different threads that I could pull from this one thought, so bear with me if I jump around a little. I'm going to try to bring it all into one idea at the end. So on the first day that I was in Tokyo, I deliberately went to four particular locations in a particular order. I wanted to sort of um, juxtaposition these, these things against one another. First, I went to the... Uh, metropolitan government offices where you can go right to the top they have two towers you can go to the top I think they're about 45 stories high and you can go up there for free and look around and so on uh, so you can get some pretty good views of Tokyo and supposedly on a clear day you can see Mount Fuji but alas it was not such a clear day uh, but nevertheless I could see a fair amount of Tokyo and Tokyo is immense but it's a pretty interesting city, architecturally, and I'm not a person who is generally interested in modern architecture. I don't like all the glass and steel. It doesn't really appeal to me. But nevertheless, it was quite interesting because some thought has gone into this. They haven't just slammed up a million of the same building. The buildings have unique character or characters to them. Um, it's quite interesting to observe them. And... Amidst all of those skyscrapers and other such buildings, there are islands of green. The Japanese have managed to preserve significant green spaces. And as I mentioned before, when it comes to parks and gardens, the Japanese really shine. They have a very particular aesthetic and they do it brilliantly. It's, it's really beautiful. So despite Tokyo being an immense city, one of the world's largest, busiest cities, it didn't have that feeling either when I was looking at it from the 45th story of, of that building or uh, when I was on the ground walking around. It, it, it didn't have that feel. It actually, I thought it'd be, it would be really intense. Maybe uh, other people who are not used to big Asian cities have that feeling when they go to Tokyo, but going from Taiwan to that, it had a really laid-back feel and uh, an aesthetic feel and so on. So... After that view, I went to um, Shinjuku Park, a little to the east. And incidentally, East Asians really seem to hate walking. The idea that I would walk for approximately 30 minutes to get to that park came as a real surprise to people. I asked some people in that building for directions. I just, actually, I just wanted to know which way uh, was east. Uh, because I, I had a general idea of where it was after that. Uh, but they they were astounded that I would walk 30 minutes. And this is something that I encountered on several other occasions. And I've encountered this in Taiwan and from other Asians generally. They, they, they really don't get this idea of walking for 30 minutes. So on my way to Shinjuku Park, there were two Germans and they had stopped out the front of a building and then I stopped as well because we all marveled as we watched a car drive into a building it looked like a garage but it drove into this um, garage onto a plat uh, onto a, a disc in the floor and that then rotated uh, 90 degrees and the car went into uh, an elevator a car elevator and presumably after that it went downstairs into a, uh, an underground car park so they have all these things because they they don't have much street parking there they don't necessarily have the space and and it allows the traffic to flow more uh, more um, smoothly and so on so they're really big on this kind of thing and you can contrast that to Taiwan where everyone parks wherever the hell they like um, so I got to Shinjuku Park, and it was beautiful. It's a really nice park. Unfortunately, it was raining, though that, that was also a blessing in disguise, I suppose, because it meant that I had the park mostly to myself. 
Um, there were very few people there that day, and it was really beautiful, really really nice park. The Japanese really do parks well. Um, and, of course, there wasn't tons of litter or antisocial behavior there. It was just, it was quite nice. After that, I went to uh, somewhere that I was really intrigued about, a place called Yasukuni Shrine. And this was built to honor Japan's war dead. Um, I think it was built during the Meiji Restoration, so that's the end of the, or towards the end of the 19th century. And it, um, the, the war dead in various wars since then have been buried in that, that uh, area. And I'm going to discuss more about um, the Yasukuni Shrine later, but needless to say, it's a fairly controversial site because 14 Class A war criminals from World War II are buried there. And several public figures have made notable appearances there and made remarks with nationalistic overtones that have upset neighboring Asian nations, particularly China and South Korea. There's also a museum there with a fairly revisionist account of Japanese history in World War II. But more on all of that later. However, the shrine did have a certain level of gravitas about it. And of course, the people there were dressed incredibly. The people there, men, women, children, were dressed like the Kennedy clan at JFK's funeral. If you know those photos to which I'm referring, the women, the men, the kids, all of them were dressed impeccably. And this was just on a, an average weekday afternoon. There was nothing special going on there. It was just random people going there, as they probably do every day various people. So there was no major events there. But it, but do ordinary people, or at least in Australia, do ordinary Australians even dress like that anymore? Um, ever? Uh, it's pretty rare, actually, in many parts of the West for people to really put that level of effort into some, just a daily activity. I was really surprised by that, actually. After that, I went to Akihabara, which is known as a center for youth culture, including anime and that sort of thing. And it's also known for electronics. And I was just about blinded by all of the neon, by all of the consumerism on offer. This was at dusk. I got there approximately at dusk and, and stayed a little while after that. So I bought a watch at a multi-story electronic store that was just immense. Uh, and then, um, I should say, at other on other occasions during my time in... Japan, I visited similar multi-story shops for all sorts of other things, including toys. They have incredible toy stores there. I went with my kid to, to a couple of toy stores. They were really amazing. Uh, but anyway, whilst I was in Akihabara, I also discovered a small store selling robots, including robot servants, and actually saw, I think it was the, the main one I saw there, I saw that at a train station. Uh, in a different part of Japan, in the um, information center, um, directing people <laughs> to, to to take tickets. And it's really weird seeing that robot there. Um, but they, they have other robots. They had robot dogs that can recognize and respond to hundreds of commands. I mean, that's better than a lot of real dogs. Um, and they even had a salt water powered robot spider. Uh, which was intriguing. Uh, I, I probably should have bought it. It was only about ten dollars. I probably should have bought one just to just to test it out, see see what would happen. Um, but on the theme of robots, on another day, I visited the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, and I saw yet more robots and all sorts of other mind-boggling exhibits. That place was was really incredible as well. Uh, but anyway, at, at the end of the day, and for the remainder of my trip, I couldn't quite reconcile all of these elements of Japan. Amazing infrastructure, beautiful people running around all day to beautiful places, buying beautiful things. Yet who will maintain these temples, these parks, and these car park elevators if no one has any children? Will it be the robot spiders and dogs? I don't know. It's it's really mind-boggling. They're, they're sort of um, half-lifing into history. Who will worship at the Yasukuni Shrine in the future? And I have real mixed feelings about the Yasukuni Shrine and Japan's history in World War II and beyond. On the one hand, 
let's not sugarcoat it. Japan was our enemy, and they treated captured Allied soldiers incredibly badly, terribly. And there was a locomotive just inside the museum at at the shrine. So the museum was off to the side, uh, and that locomotive was used to build the Thailand Burma Railway. Now the Japanese gloss over the fact that the railway, which is also known as the uh, the Death Railway, I believe, uh, was built with forced labor. More than a fifth of the 60,000 Allied prisoners of war, including 2,802 Australians, died in its construction under fairly brutal conditions. Really, I, I mean, the climate and disease and all of that was bad enough, but the Japanese were, were awful to them. And nobody knows how many Southeast Asians were also forced to work in the construction either. They're often overlooked, but they know that there were at least 180,000 Southeast Asians forced into building this thing as well, and presumably their death count was enormous also. At the end of the war, all 111 Japanese military officials involved were tried for war crimes, and 32 of them were executed. Furthermore, Japan has never paid reparations to the Southeast Asian victims. And this is just one very small part of the Japanese involvement in World War II. Putting it simply, I'm glad that the Americans broke Imperial Japan, including dropping two nuclear bombs on them in the process. I, I, I don't think anyone should apologize for that. It was necessary. It was absolutely necessary. On the other hand, though, what is modern Japan with its herbivore males and cosplay enthusiasts? Was this the price that they had to pay? Or would they have got to the same place regardless? I don't know. How is it also that... Despite Japan having been completely cucked by the U.S. after World War II, there are still people who put on their finest livery to, to visit the Yasukuni Shrine, and, and they're unapologetic about it, uh, despite, or perhaps even because of, its controversial nature. They believe in Japan. Yet in the West, we are simultaneously tearing down such places. I mean, we've seen all of that this year, right? Uh, or co-opting them somehow within the POSD agenda, where didn't you know that in 1915 the Anzacs died at Gallipoli because diversity has always been our strength? Speaking of diversity, I think that I can answer part of my earlier question about what's going to happen in Japan. The motto of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, I saw posters around the place in, in uh, Tokyo, is unity in diversity. Think about that one for a second. It's happening there too. This scourge is everywhere. I'm sure that the IOC has sent the Japanese government a directive to increase the trucks of peace and dildos in the kindergarten curriculum by 2020. Targets must be met. One thing that I found quite surprising in Japan was foreigners working in normal jobs. That is not English teaching or in a foreign restaurant or that kind of thing as would be found in Taiwan and many other parts of Asia. I saw a foreigner working in a kiosk at a train station. <laughs> I did a double take with that one. I saw another hosting the, just a, an average demonstration at the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation. He, he did it all in Japanese. Uh, but I thought, why? Why Why do they have a foreigner doing that? Uh, was this for ideological reasons, to make Japan seem more open, more diverse, and so on? Or was it because they don't have enough young people to fill these kinds of positions anymore? Either way, the implications are not very good for Japan. Analogous to this is that one day I went to a shop to buy some nappies, what Americans call diapers, for my son. And there was a section of the store with two and a half floor-to-ceiling shelves full of such things for elderly people. And I kept walking around. I couldn't find them for my son. So eventually I asked one of the employees where I could find what I was looking for. On two shelves, on a temporary structure out the front of the store. So two shelves for kids, two and a half floor-to-ceiling shelves for adults old people. Now that tells you a lot about the state of Japan and where it's headed and, and it's not good. So Japan was cool, beautiful, amazing, 
well-ordered, civilized, intriguing, all sorts of things. It, it, it was just a really amazing place. It's it's like nothing I've ever experienced before, really. It 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 was its whole. It, it was a thing unto itself, and yet it was also part of the civilized, developed world. It wasn't Western. It was its own thing. They really are honorary Aryans. Yet Japan is dying. It's an AIDS patient, just like everywhere else in the developed world. Sure, they don't have all the diversity yet. I should say yet, uh, because that's coming. Really, that's coming, and 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 it's going to be heartbreaking to see that when you see the first truck of peace in Tokyo or Kyoto, when when some loon blows up a, a beautiful temple in in Kyoto, uh, when they or when they build a big mosque there or something like that. I mean, it's going to be heartbreaking, but I think all of that's coming. Um, and, and it goes way deeper than the Jews or any of that other stuff. Something went horribly wrong in the 20th century, not just in the West. And maybe it was always going to go wrong because that's comfort and modernity and development. I don't know. Yet what was the alternative? One way or another, Japan was on a collision course with the West, and in particular the US, in the middle of the 20th century. And one way or another, all of us were going to end up being somebody's comfort women in this regard. And in such a circumstance, it, it seems like on a long enough timeline, somebody's eventually going to give you AIDS. And that's Japan like everywhere else, and it's, it's tragic to see it, because this is not just a Western disease. But anyway, that that's uh, one video about this topic. Uh, there, there are others that are sort of tangents to it, but nevertheless, uh, those are some of my thoughts on Japan. There's probably a lot more, but it, it just hasn't sort of come out yet. Uh, anyway, as always, thank you for listening, and if you have any comments, please write them beneath this video. If you liked this video, please subscribe to this channel and share this video with others. And also consider supporting this channel financially. You can do so via the information beneath this video.